Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. I've really missed our fire drill Fridays. I don't know about you, but right now I feel, I feel like a year's worth of news has happened and the holidays were about six months ago. Do you feel that way too? My God. And um, I want to start by addressing the horrifying attempted coup on Wednesday. You know, it was a sickening display of white supremacy and evidence of profound irresponsibility by government officials. It was just, it was sickening. It was also a sobering reminder of the wounds we, 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 we have to heal and how fragile democracy is and our unrelenting responsibility to speak truth to power. I was really sickened by the strike and the striking differences in the brutal way that Capitol Police responded to Black Lives Matter protesters a few months ago compared to their absence or maybe even collaboration during yesterday's violent insurrection, Wednesday's violent insurrection. It really shows how, how broken our justice system is. And what happened this week is not gonna be forgotten. We can't allow it to be forgotten. The events at the Capitol were born out of, a, of an ideology of racism and hatred and desperation. But it's important that we realize that it's precisely because our movements are gaining ground and winning victories and fundamentally changing the shape of American democracy that has blatantly exposed the deep corruption of our opponents. You know, white supremacy, like patriarchy, it's a wounded beast. And there's nothing more dangerous than a wounded beast as it flails in its death throes. Let's make sure that they are death throes. The truth is we are winning. Most people are deeply concerned about climate change and injustice and economic injustice and want to protect the future of the planet. And for the first time in 11 years, both congressional chambers are now led by people that are not only more likely to embrace the kind of climate legislation we need, but also get it passed. Go Georgia. And now with the elections over, we can, we can get back to digging into our key issues. And on the top of the list is, let me hear you say it, getting off fossil fuels, right. And we can leave our bunker mentality behind. You know, the four year long, totally on the defensive mindset where we were just battling to stay in place on climate. Things are so different now. We are different now. Science has changed. The climate movement has grown. More people than ever are concerned about it. And we're now working with the first climate president ever. And thanks to many of you for your hard work and helping us to get here. But we need to stay in emergency mode, right? Do you hear me? We need to stay in emergency mode. The most powerful forces are still arrayed to protect fossil fuels. And we have to ensure that President Biden does, does what he promised on climate. So today, what we're gonna do today is give you a, a refresher on how powerful, corrupt, and dangerous the fossil fuel industry really is. That brings me to today's good news. Dare I bring out the xylophone? Okay. Good news, Lloyd's Market. The world's biggest insurance market has bowed to pressure from environmental campaigners and set a market-wide policy to stop new insurance coverage for coal, oil sands, and Arctic energy pro projects by 2022 and to pull out of the business altogether by 2030. This is a big deal. Good things are happening. And now let's talk about fossil fuels. You know, a lot of people and organizations are fighting like hell for the climate by focusing all their efforts on the sustainable energy sector. And that's, that's great. Electric vehicles, renewable energy, clean tech, they all play a crucial role in reducing the amount of fossil fuels consumed. However, in order to meet the goals set by the Paris Climate Treaty, we have to reduce the amount of fossil fuels produced. Remember, I've talked before about the, the two blades of the scissors, produced and consumed, both have to be addressed. Fossil fuels are the main drivers 
of climate change. Agricultural practices, land use, the infamous cow burps, and they are burps, not farts, okay? Other things, they contribute to the crisis, but fossil fuels are by far the largest contributor. Globally, we already have more fossil fuels in reserves and developed than fit within our climate budget. In other words, continuing just the existing fossil fuel operations, never mind new ones, blows our remaining carbon allowance. There's no wiggle room to be adding new fossil fuel production projects if we want to stay below the, the Paris goals in, in, in wanting to, to deter the most the worst impacts of climate change. And scientists are now saying that the Paris goals are not ambitious enough. Okay, so this slide that I'm showing you shows clearly what I'm talking about. To the left, the dark colors, you'll see the already developed reserves, coal on top, then gas, that blue slice, then oil. And to the right, shows our carbon budget if we allowed climate to warm to two degrees Celsius, which scientists say today would be catastrophic. But that's where we'd be if we burned all the existing reserves. To keep warming to one and a half degrees Celsius, which is the graph in the middle, and which is what science says we have to do, you see that we're restricted to burning less than half the developed reserves. So a whole lot of what they've already drilled, pumped, and fracked will have to just remain unused. I mean, look at that. That, that is a dramatic graph. And the uh, you'll probably know this, but the 2018 IPCC UN study documented that we need to reduce carbon emissions by 50%, by half, by 2030, and then keep reducing to zero by 2050. Now, in practice, this means we need to reduce fossil fuels by half in less than a decade. The U.S., like many countries, has a major gap between our stated climate goals and the continued production of fossil fuels. Researchers say that the production of coal, oil, and gas must fall by 6% a year, 6% a year, until 2030 to keep global heating under the one and a half degrees Celsius target, which was what was agreed to in the Paris Accord and avoid severe climate disruption. But nations are planning production increases of 2% a year. And the G20 countries are giving 50% more coronavirus recovery funding to fossil fuels than to clean energy. And the US, as we know, is the epicenter of global fossil fuel expansion right now. That's why a response to the climate crisis must reduce both the production and consumption of fossil fuels. There's a lot of work happening on reducing the consumption of fossil fuels. And the work is advancing on multiple fronts. But as I say, there has historically been a hesitancy to say what science demands, we have to start a responsibly managed phase out of fossil fuel production while at the same time safeguarding fossil fuel dependent workers and communities in the process. That's what's called a just transition. If we, if we reduce fossil fuel consumption as we're doing through electrical vehicles and cons you know, renewables and, and all the sustainable energy, but we continue to produce and export fossil fuels, we cancel out the gains. That's why one of the most important tools in the next president's toolbox would be reinstating the oil export ban that the Obama administration put in place and expanding it to cover gas. There are many ways to reduce fossil fuel expansion and then start the wind down. We start by saying no new fossil fuels because new investments lock us into continued carbon production. We do what, what Biden has already pledged to end fossil fuel production on public land. We stop fossil fuel exports, fossil fuel subsidies, and fossil fuel overseas financing. I mean, the science is so clear and so dire 
that some countries are already starting to do those things. You know, I announced last month in December that the Danish parliament announced that it will cancel all future licensing rounds for new oil and gas exploration and production permits in the Danish part of the North Sea and end existing production by 2050. As a major oil producing country in the EU, Denmark's announcement is a landmark decision toward the necessary phase out of fossil fuels. Additionally, the political agreement allocates money to secure a just transition for impacted workers. And then just last week, believe it or not, December 2020, the UK announced a new precedent setting commitment that would end virtually all of their overseas support for fossil fuels, which will take billions in government backed finance for oil and gas off the board and will hopefully influence other governments to take similar steps. You know, the Biden campaign has committed to ending US export finance for high carbon projects. And this UK commitment sets up a strong case to end US support for oil and gas, as well as coal. We simply must transition off fossil fuels. And the longer we wait, the harder the challenge will be and the fewer options we're gonna to have to do this in a way that is responsible and just. Now, to help us understand everything we need to know, about the fossil fuel industry. I'm, I'm just thrilled that our guest today is Antonia Juhas, an investigative journalist and author specializing in climate and fossil fuels, especially oil. She writes for Rolling Stone, Harper's Newsweek, Atlantic, The New York Times, CNN, The Nation. That's among others, there's a whole lot. She does a lot of writing. And she's the author of three books, Black Tide, The Devastating Impact of the Gulf Oil Spill, the Tyranny of Oil, and the Bush Agenda. Antonia founded and runs the Uncovering Oil Investigative Reporting Program, and she's a birther fellow in investigative journalism, working with a team of international journalists on the climate crisis, fossil fuels, and corporate power. She also recently delivered the TEDx talk, How Women and Girls Are Leading the Way to End the Fossil Fuel Era. Welcome, Antonia. I'm just so grateful to you for spending time with us today and sharing your expertise. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Jane. Uh, after this week, I can't imagine a better way to spend today than with you and all of your viewers. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And to start with, what role do fossil fuels and the oil industry play in contributing to the climate emergency? Basic question. Well, the primary means of global warming, the primary contributor is the burning of fossil fuels. And we have spent 150 years with a fossil fuel industry that has been hell bent on expanding its operations, expanding dependence to its products and dependence to the industry as the purveyor of those products. And through you know mass expansion of production all around the world. We have a world that is now hardwired still to oil in particular and fossil fuel products. But the industry has contributed not only by driving um, its, its wedge into political decisions, economic decisions, decisions that affect our health, um, our welfare, social justice, environmental justice, equity, wars, peace, pollution, the environment. But on climate, in addition to, to producing the product that contributes the most to global warming and the climate crisis, we also, I think, should start off by talking about the denialism of the industry that companies led by ExxonMobil discovered in the mid 70s that the burning of fossil fuels would cause disastrous impacts to the climate, leading to disastrous impacts for humans and our environment and other species, then sat on that science and then pushed an aggressive, heavily financed campaign to make us believe the opposite, that the opposite was true, to fuel and finance climate denialism, while they continued, of course, 
to pump this uh, resource into our economy, our politics, our, our veins, losing decades of time where more destruction happened and decades of time that we lost fighting, just trying to say climate change is real. The burning of fossil fuels leads to climate change, having to just make that argument and lose all that time on action. Yeah, if they had told the truth, we, we could have had a an incremental phase out, right? I think it, if they had told of, the truth, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, it's because of their dishonesty, you know, I mean, I think they should be tried for crimes against humanity and the environment because the reason that we're in this incredibly small window, this tiny little window of time to do something unimaginably hard is because of them. Yeah, I mean, it's so you had, it's not just that we, you know, I think lost that time for action. It's also the energy, money, time, effort that's been expended over decades in just trying to grab a hold again of the science that they have always known to be true, that the burning of fossil fuels damages the climate to disastrous impact. That was in the original 1970s findings of Exxon. And we've also learned that Shell had at the similar time, similar studies. And we're still in this um, waste of time, waste of energy, waste of money that supports what is known by the the purveyors of the of the myth knew it to be a myth from the beginning. Um, you know, fortunately, I think we I, I believe that we have come out of that time, I would say, where that dominates so much energy. But it is, as you say, just this tragic, tragic loss of time. But it also speaks to the the extreme wealth that this industry had uh, accumulated, which was part and parcel to its influence over politics and, and policy. So it also constrained, of course, not only um, the options that were available on climate, but the options that were available through our political system on you know, how to best rein in the use of fossil fuels. So while we've been dependent on it, limiting the policy options that were available to address fossil fuels directly, primarily through their deep um, control, the industry's deep control th over decades of politics, uh, policies, and governments as well. I mean, the fact that the former CEO of ExxonMobil, because Rex Tillerson was our Secretary of State, I mean, it's just... A Secretary of State who found the Trump administration to be too uh, unwild, you know, uh, too difficult to deal with, and so he left. I mean, that actually is even you know, to, to say where we where we are now with the Trump administration, which I you know I wrote an entire book, The Bush Agenda, which was about the ties between the Bush administration and the fossil fuel industry, and I thought that was going to be the pinnacle of U.S. Um, you know. Uh, inter intertwining with the fossil fuel industry. The Trump administration took it to an entirely different place. And actually the Trump administration went so far in granting every wish and dream uh, of the fossil fuel industry and doing it in a way that was um, so uh, harming to the industry's public face that I think that's why Rex Tillerson actually found that it was not worth his, it was, it was harming his ability to move forward in his work to stay within the Trump administration. And that is saying, you know, a tremendous amount. So tell me something or tell us all something. How, how much oil is left in the world and how does this affect the behavior of the fossil fuel industry? So for a very long time, the conversation for, for decades, starting in the seventies was about uh, this concern over reaching peak oil, the point at which the supply of oil would be uh, diminished around the world. And I actually think uh, over decades, an increasing attention was paid on that fear, that uncertainty about what that would mean. And that the actual um, concern about what it would mean when we got to peak oil, I think, for example, for many environmentalists, when they were talking about raising concern about peak oil, what they wanted, although this part of the conversation didn't happen often enough, was therefore, you know, the 
the problems that are going to emerge when we get to that point, we want to head off. So because it's going to be disastrous, so we need to get off of oil faster. But that second part of the conversation didn't happen enough. What happened more was this concern, we're going to hit peak supply, hit peak supply. And that, I think, fed into the industry's ability to say, um, yes, it's, you know, we're really worried about hitting peak supply, so you need to let us go anywhere, go everywhere for oil. And that's what happened. Um, really, the floodgates opened up on you know going deep, deep, far, deep into the ocean, into tar, you know, removing um, uh, the boreal forest in Canada to go deep into the tar sands to break into rock and shale all across the United States, all across the world to get at a, a bit of, of oil or natural gas. We opened up every vein, and they've tapped into it. And so now I. There's oil everywhere. I don't see that we're going to run out of it anytime soon. The main concern for the industry at this point, and that is the you know uh, hope for um, getting off these fuels, is peak demand. That we have actually gotten to a point where the world has woken up to these uh, threats and dangers. And I think more importantly, you know, from the history of of oil development in the world, which is just a 150 year development. There, wherever there has been production, transport, refining of oil and other fossil fuels, there has been a community on the front line that has resistance, resisted from the very birth of the industry. And I think that what has changed is that more people are now listening to the voices of those who have the longest experience with those harms the experience with resisting them and overcoming them, at the same time as more of us have also become frontline people su suffering on the front line. So for example, I'm in Colorado, there's fracking down the street from me. There didn't used to be a year ago, now there is. Now I'm on the front line. And more of us can now appreciate through that experience and through of course, far worsening climate impacts, You know, so many more people suffering the harms of, climate, of the climate crisis. We can now appreciate and finally fully listen to those primarily people of color, communities of color, indigenous communities, low-income communities who have suffered these harms the greatest, the longest, listen to that experience and say, okay, yes, we really do need to listen and, and learn how to get off of these resources. And that's led to this point where their biggest concern at this point is, is peak demand of their product being reached, not peak supply. Yeah. Thanks. The the price of, of fossil fuel fell below zero for the first time ever during the pandemic. I mean, all those oil filled tankers, you can see them off the coast of Southern California. They're just sitting out there with no place to go. How how has this affected the standing in the financial markets? So the impact so what has happened during COVID has just um, made much more extreme and made, made much worse problems that were facing the industry for years coming into the COVID crisis. So for several years or for, for a buildup over many years, there has been pressure from all sides that have been dwindling, uh, the, that have reduced the growth and demand for fossil fuels and oil, that have increased the alternatives, the accessibility and the affordability of alternatives that have reduced um, the political support, the financial support from the finance sector for the industry, um, that have essentially made it so that there is less and less and less demand and support for their product. They responded by basically, you've got a product that is the price for it is, is falling and the growth in demand is falling, but they still needed to make the same amount of money, US frackers in particular, governments that are dependent on oil and other fossil fuels responded to that contraction in price and demand by producing more because they had to produce more to get the same return so they were all they had already created this gut glut of supply as mm -hmm. early as 2018 they had already been losing finance they had already been used, losing profits then you entered into covid and of course demand cratered much further because the primary thing that drives consumption of oil and other fossil fuels is cars, trucks, pl 
planes, it's transportation. So when we stopped doing that, demand just contracted, you know, dramatically, and then the glut, but they kept producing. <laughs> so for a time, that glut just became a tsunami, and they stuffed all that oil out into sea, which is why it was all on those cargo ships and still is, because they're still banking on if they keep producing, I mean, there has been a contraction of demand, of sorry, of supply ultimately, but only um, a, a small portion have they contracted how much they produce versus the fall in demand. So they put it out to sea and are using our seas as this sort of storage facility for their product on the expectation that demand will come back and that they can make money trading it, trading, uh, the look, trading it off of those ships and the storage uh, and the tankers. Um, and so they are now facing this, um, you know, a, a death by a thousand cuts and where they were already suffering, already an industry in crisis. COVID-19 has really brought them down to, you know, um, a, a, a potentially a fraction of themselves, potentially. And yet they're still trying to drill. I mean, I was on a Zoom meeting yesterday with hundreds of indigenous leaders on the front line, South Dakota, Minnesota, fighting Keystone XL and Line 3 and down in the Gulf region. They're, and, and these miners, these, these oil workers are coming in and they're bringing COVID with them. It's a catastrophe. They're, why are they still doing this? Well, so this is where you we get back to where your you know introduction explained, which is the necessity of keep it in the ground policies. So even faced with the most extreme problems of supply, price, demand, they continue to produce and they produce more. So unless you're telling them to stop at the site of production, which by the way is something that the US has a long history in. We've put in place moratoriums on offshore drilling, on drilling in sensitive areas. Um, it's something that, that we do and it's something that the world has done. Um, unless you put in place, keep it in the ground policies, you know, I think what it comes down to, first of all, of course, there's still money to be made right now from producing this resource. And what's happening is that production in the United States is concentrating into certain areas and for certain means. So what we're going to see is the larger companies buying up the smaller ones. You're going to see an even more powerful Exxon, more powerful Chevron, more powerful BP and Shell concentrated in Texas, New Mexico, uh, probably some in Colorado where I'm at, probably still some in California, but concentrated on, and the tar sands, which is where the, the line three uh, oil is coming from the tar sands and passing through. And all of these and Dakota Access Pipeline are oil that is coming down into the Gulf Coast to be refined into the feedstocks for plastics, which they believe they'll still have a, a market for, and to be exported out, uh, to be sold into other markets that are still seeing growth in consumption, which is primarily in East Asia. They also all believe, I believe every oil company believes that they're going to be the company that sells that last barrel of oil and it's going to be worth a lot of money. Right. And so even when we have, for example, BP, which has talked about um, shifting itself to be a, a green energy company in the future, even in their most ambitious plans, they still uh, are going, they still state right now that at least two thirds of their um, operations will be oil and natural gas still, even in their most ambitious yeah. hurdle because they believe there's still going to be a market and they're going to keep producing it. And their plans for production are far more than we can um, have to keep to 1.5 degrees Celsius and for conditions of environmental or social justice or public health. Yeah, well, the graph showed that very clearly. So you, you mentioned exporting. Let's talk about exporting. I mean, the Obama administration um, uh, had a ban on exporting oil that was lifted by the Trump administration. Why should we make stopping the exporting of fossil fuels a major demand? Well, I think it's emerged as a major demand because right now I think it's quite clear that the industry in the United States sees its future in exports, that 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 is the way that the industry intends to save itself, either, as I say, through converting oil and natural gas into the feedstocks for plastics to be exported 
Um, liquefied natural gas is now uh, booming with new construction sites um, for exporting of liquefied natural gas. Again, it's us is all concentrating down in the U.S. Gulf Coast. Product, uh, you know, product coming from uh, indigenous uh, communities, lands in, as I said, Canada, in North Dakota, in Texas, in New Mexico, then passing through, uh, you know, they don't call it Cancer Alley in Louisiana where all of this product ends up getting concentrated for nothing. These are black communities that have suffered from decades of harm from the fossil fuel industry that are now the new sites for this export industry that's that's building up. It's also, you know, the exporting is not just about um, how the industry hopes to make money from the product. One of the other ways that I believe they hope to save themselves is by this, the trading part that I mentioned. Um, so trading in fossil fuels as a commodity that is something to make money just from the trading from. So you've got um, Wilbur Ross, who is the current um, Energy Commerce Secretary, makes his money from shipping of fuels on those tankers that we talked about. That's how he, one of the many ways that he makes billions of dollars. Um, that they could, if, they, if they're able to keep producing, so if you don't stop at the point of production, if they're able to keep producing, they're coming up with all sorts of ways to make money if the only thing that we're focusing on is that, is that consumption end, then they're gonna find other ways to make money plastics, trading, liquefied natural gas, et cetera. And that's where the exports come in. Right, thank you for that explanation. Yeah, we're, we're next week our guests are gonna be from the Gulf area and boy, do they have stories. It's just unthinkable what's going on. But yeah, last year Exxon announced our future is plastic. <laughs> so, so I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, I think most people don't necessarily appreciate that plastics, the prime, prime Plastics primarily come from oil and natural gas. And this idea that if we just stop consuming again, that so, okay, so maybe it's okay that it's plastics and so that at least it doesn't harm the climate in the same way, I think some people believe. Well, I found one of just one new facility that's being proposed in Cancer Alley in Louisiana, one facility that converts oil and natural gas into the feedstocks for plastics would contribute the same amount as three coal fired power plants. Oh my God. So this conversion process is climate intensive, not to mention, or also to mention, excuse me, the environmental injustice of all of these um, facilities being located in these communities that have already borne the brunt. Yeah. We didn't even mention the offshore drilling that of course is also concentrated in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you know, of, of, the, of these practices already. Yeah. A great book, and I'm sure you've read it, is um, uh, Hochschild's book, Strangers in Their Own Land. Sitting on my desk right over there, I'm reading it right now. I recommend it to everybody. <laughs> oh, that is really, yeah. that really tells the story. So a Antonia, explain the meaning of managed decline, meaning managed decline of fossil fuel. What is a managed decline of fossil fuel? So, right, so if we're gonna start keeping fossil fuels in the ground, how do we do it in, in a way that is equitable and just? And managed decline says, it's not like we're just gonna tell everybody all at once, everyone stops producing immediately. As I said in the beginning, the world is still hardwired for oil. When the price of oil, for example, went up to $150 a barrel in 2008, that helped precipitate the global financial crisis because countries that had to buy oil couldn't afford it. When oil went down to negative 40 degrees this year, that contributed to devastating harms for poor countries that are still dependent on producing oil and other fossil fuels in the middle of a, of a, of a global crisis, uh, already existing COVID crisis. So how do we do this in a way that doesn't you know, self-destruct a, a planet that we're trying to save from self-destructing um, and our economy? And, is, is equitably and just to the, to the communities and nations that have already borne the biggest brunt of our fossil fuel economy. So managed decline says, first, those communities that have and nations that have borne the greatest harms of fossil fuels without the benefits, start, start focusing on helping those communities keep their mm -hmm. fossil fuels in the ground first. And those communities and nations 
that can afford to go fastest, quickest, meaning they have other resources to which they can turn, uh, where oil or fossil fuel production is a small percentage of their GDP, where they have the wealth and resources and capacity to transition workers in a just and equitable way to support those communities go fastest, soonest. And that is places like, you know, the North Sea deciding to keep its fossil fuels in the ground, New Zealand deciding to keep, uh, to ban all new offshore drilling as well. A state like California, where you're in, is a sort of obvious example of a state that has the means and capacity to go first and go fastest. <laughs> but our governor won't do it. Well, your governor won't do it. However, I will say that Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, when she was candidate Kamala Harris, put forward a proposal, a remarkable proposal, to have the United States lead a global negotiation for the managed decline of fossil fuel production worldwide. That's a phenomenal proposal to, to follow her in doing that and to have someone like Deb Holland at Interior, Michael Regan at EPA, uh, Brenda Mallory at White House Council for Environmental Quality. These folks, I think, can be called on to implement um, that idea that Canada Harris has already put on the table. Yeah. I just want you to know we are working hard in California to shame Gavin Newsom into doing what's right. Why he keeps signing thousands of new permits, it makes us scratch our head. But um, listen, so I get asked a lot, well, well, you're talking all about the United States. What about China? What about India? You know, what about what about Nigeria? What's the best way for the U.S. to influence global reduction? Well, I think there, there's two pieces in terms of global policy. Having Donald Trump no longer be president of the United States is a really good place to start because Trump, I believe, aligned more than any other U.S. president with Vladimir Putin, with Mohammed bin Salman from Saudi Arabia to work to maintain fossil fuels as our dominant resources. And Putin is gonna continue with that goal and Mohammed bin Salman is gonna continue with that goal. And they are the two most powerful players pursuing that goal in tandem. China, China has an all of the above uh, approach, all resources that it can get in every way that it can get them. It is definitely a driver and funder of continued fossil fuel um, consumption and production and expansion. And I think that the number one thing that the US can do first is to um, challenge allies to shift off of fossil fuels as rapidly as possible in a way that is fair and equitable. And then that brings us to Paris. So Par the Paris Climate Accord, rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, recommitting to the commitments of Paris, which are not only increasing our ambition to our own goals to achieving Paris, calling on our allies and everyone who's a party to Paris to do the same, but meeting the financial commitment, which was a $500 billion financial commitment by 2025 to help countries transition away from fossil fuels, to help countries adapt to the climate crisis. I believe that we need to add to that contribution, which is specific money that actually goes to helping countries keep fossil fuels in the ground and actually help pay them to do it. That gets you at a country like Nigeria, which is deeply dependent on fossil fuels and would have to spend a great deal of time trying to unwind from it because it is its key financial um, support. Yeah, China, it's not its key financial support. So China actually does, is influenced by public pressure, is influenced by, um, what increases its stature globally. And right now, the message that has gone out to China and our and our allies is what will increase your stature globally is to join us in this uh, fossil fuel um, uh, endeavor. And by shifting away, by supporting the production of renewables, by supporting the market for renewables, it will help um, push China to see that as a means of increasing its own influence and its own uh, position, which is to join that, you know, that team. Am I, am I crazy or do, does Biden have something in his climate plan 
that calls for us sending money to countries like Nigeria and others to help them get off fossil fuel. You know, I'm not sure if, if, that's, if that's happening. I'm not positive. I seem to think so. You know, I, I watched with great pleasure your TEDx talk, which I just loved. And so let's, I want, I want you to tell our audience, in what ways do you think gender and female leadership are tied to the fight to, st to stop the climate change? Well, uh, thank you for bringing attention to it. Um, so, you know, the topic of, of my TEDx talk was how women and girls are leading the way to the end of the fossil fuel era. And it's based on my reporting where I have, uh, you know, traveled the world. Um, I've been in a submarine at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico at the site of the BP oil spill with Dr. Samantha Joy, a woman leading in these incredible efforts. Uh, across Afghanistan, um, looking at the role of oil in the war in Afghanistan, across the United States, across the world. And I continue to meet women who are at the forefront of these efforts. And I think, I think the main reason why is that women and girls are so disproportionately impacted by fossil fuels in the climate crisis. Women and girls are 14 times more likely to die in a climate emergency than are men. Living near oil and gas operations increases the likelihood that a woman will suffer a preterm birth, the leading cause of infant death in the United States significantly. Women and girls are responsible for up to 80% of global food production, which means that things like oil spills, um, the uh, crises, climate crises of drought, of floods, of tsunamis, impact their ability to provide this fundamental resource. And they have stood up in resistance to these impacts and have led um, resistance campaigns, you know, across, across what well, we were talking, you know, before we started about Dakota Access Pipeline, um, line three, uh, you know, these are all examples of places where women have taken leadership positions in the Gulf Coast. I featured um, Sharon Levine, a 67 year old uh, woman who lives in Cancer Alley, who has been leading efforts there. Yacinda Ardern of New Zealand, uh, the first person to implement a just transit, a federal just transition office uh, in New Zealand at the same time as she put in place uh, a moratorium on new offshore oil and gas development. Your organizing and your work, and I think the examples uh, just abound um, of women that have taken these positions, and I think highlighting and drawing attention to their work and the disproportionate harms they face. Also, I would add women as environmental defenders who have faced uh, incredible death risks, um, harms, sexual assault, sexual abuse in those roles have also proven their bravery uh, against you know, devastating odds also uh, in doing this work. Yeah, I, um, in, you know, my, I've had book clubs around the country using my, my climate book about Fire Drill Fridays. And um, one of the things that has come up in every one of the, of the book club meetings uh, on Zoom, how shocked they were to hear about the relationship between sexual violence and, um, and the climate crisis. It's uh, people just don't realize it. So I, we don't have time to get into that right now, but I urge people to read my book and to think about this. Um, my last question for you, uh, Antonia, is, is what actions or policies have had the greatest impact on holding the oil companies accountable? You know, what I think has been really um, important is the, and has been the most impactful on the industry and in putting it into this place that it's at, which is, it is really you know, sort of important to point out the oil industry is on this precipice where it is entirely dependent on the actions of the public, on public policy, on whether we will double down on fossil fuels and the industry will remain powerful um, or we will turn a corner and policy and practice and action will you know, transform the industry into, into a shadow of itself. And that is a, a precipice that it is balancing on right now. It is at the weakest point that it has been at um, probably since uh, Ida Tarbell, speaking of powerful women, 
uh, helped lead a, a movement that led to the breakup of Standard Oil uh, over a hundred years ago. Um, you know, we are we are it is at that sort of fragile at a uh, of a place, and it is really up to the actions of of people listening uh, to decide what is that fate ultimately going to be. And the actions that have gotten us here are you know plentiful. It includes. Uh, you know the the robust uh, divestment movement, which has has worked. Um, you know, modeling itself after uh, the successful uh, South African apartheid divestment movement um, to move over a, a oh sorry, is it eleven trillion dollars? Do I have that number right? Eleven trillion dollars. Probably in more by now. More uh, in divestment from um, oil natural gas and coal, that divestment movement of banks, of financial institutions to divest their oil and gas holdings led to a sister movement, which is to force those same institutions to divest from finance for financing pipelines and other infrastructure projects and from financing of the companies. Um, you know, direct actions that have halted operations production in their tracks, um, organizing that has led to um, essentially shining a spotlight on the actions of the companies and the impacts on frontline communities that has helped gain, give more people greater awareness about the um, history and impacts of the industry to remove their political clout, um, which I think is, uh, has had a dramatic uh, impact on the industry. You know, the pushing of policies to support, of course, renewable energy so that it's more accessible and more affordable. Um, transportation solutions, focusing on public transportations uh, as a public transportation so that we, uh, you know, use less energy in total in our transportation needs. And I would just add in terms of what's worked, I think also those that have organized to say, you know, humans have cohabitated with fossil fuels for millennia. These are natural resources. They're not renewable, but they're natural. It's only in the last 150 years that these companies, and it's the same companies from that breakup of Standard Oil to today, have taken these resources and turned them into these unbelievably destructive, harmful uh, uh, commodities. And the idea that those same companies should now be entrusted to provide us with the wind and the sun and the waves and trusting them to become clean energy companies. I think that work in challenging that, that space is incredibly important right now because that's where we're at is will they save themselves by saying, okay, we're gonna do clean energy here. And as I said with BP, but two thirds is gonna be oil and natural gas over, over there. And, and how you can have an equitable and just um, transition for energy if the same companies that created the problem are are leading that solution. And I think that's really important work uh, right now as well. Yeah, one, one of the beauties of, uh, of the renewable energy sector, and this is talked about in the, in the Green New Deal, is that it can be locally owned, it can be decentralized, it can empower communities when they're in control of their own energy source. The fossil fuel industry isn't going to do that with renewable energy. Um, do we have time, Maddie, for some audience questions? Antonia is so amazing. She just knows everything. I don't think I've ever talked to anybody that so clearly um, has done deep dives into this issue of the fossil fuels. Do we have time to... to for audience questions? We do, we have maybe about nine, eight minutes for audience questions and we're definitely not gonna get to all of them, but there are some really good ones in here. Um, so from Lewis on Facebook, and we've gotten a few of these, um, I definitely wanna keep learning about this after the call ends. What are some sort of beginner friendly resources that you suggest, Antonia? Well, of course I suggest my my work, of course. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I've tried to do my writing in a way that I think is is very accessible to as many people as possible, um, showing both the people who are leading these efforts um, and the issues that they're confronting. And um, I not so unstrategically posted some of my books behind my shoulder. So you can look at my books, um, Black Tide, The Tyranny of Oil, uh, are two in particular on these topics, um, looking at the relationship of war 
and militarism and fossil fuels is my first book, The Bush Agenda. And then the rest of my work is on my website, which is antoniauhas.net, um, which I think we'll share a link on. And then, you know, I, I link to a number of groups that I think do really great research on this. Um, Oil Change International is a really good resource and place uh, uh, to look at. Um, the um, Stockholm Institute is another one. Um, and I'm going to forget lots of groups right now trying to do this off the top of my head. So check out my site, which has links to lots of good groups. Thank you. Um, and this was touched on right before we switched over to audience questions, but um, from Jimmy on Zoom, is there a plan in place to help fossil fuel workers remain employed if we were to transition to a clean energy economy? If not, how do we help make that happen? Yeah, it's a really important question. So I think, you know, and it's one of the primary foci of the Green New Deal, uh, which is how do you put in place a just transition? And the Green New Deal is filled with um, uh, you know, sources of uh, federal support that would help in that transition. And then I would say, um, you know, it's th the first thing is just to think about where those jobs can go right away. And two places where those jobs can go right away is, you know, pipeline workers, for example, are agnostic as to what passes through the pipe. What passes through the pipe makes a huge difference on the safety of their jobs, but it doesn't make a difference on their ability to work. And our nation is in desperate need of rebuilding our water pipelines and our sewage pipelines. And oil and gas workers can, oil and gas pipeline workers can go to work right away doing that if we support that work. And oil on the production side, um, we have a huge problem of abandoned oil and gas wells that are still polluting offshore and onshore. And we will have a bigger problem with that as more of these companies go bankrupt right now and these across the country. And putting those workers to work cleaning up and clo safely closing in um, oil and gas wells will, will put a lot of people to work for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And transitioning, of course, into renewable energy, where there is tremendous work happening on, on retraining uh, oil, natural gas, and coal workers into renewable sector energy workers. And there's just you know a huge amount of growth there. Whereas in the oil and gas sector, that uh, sector has been contracting in employment um, for years, not just under COVID, where 100,000 oil and gas workers have lost their jobs, but they've been trying to replace workers for years as they try and save money. And they've been um, trying to do as much through um, computerized work instead of human work for years. So where that sector is contracting in jobs and not a safe future for oil and gas workers, even before COVID, you have this massive growth industry, which is the renewable energy sector. So I don't understand why big labor, you know, part of the AFL-CIO is still so um, resistant to a transition away from fossil fuels, given that the fossil fuel industry, as you say, um, God, especially the coal industry, um, is not very good to its workers, you know. But on the other hand, the solar industry is uh, doesn't pay as good wages as the fossil fuel industry. They're not socialized. I mean, look at Elon Musk fires anybody that tries to unionize or bargain for better wages. So this, we have to make sure that the that the renewable energy sector becomes labor friendly and offers good wages and benefits and collective bargaining power. <clears throat> I think you know ensuring that those are unionized jobs and that there's good union protections, which hopefully the the Biden administration is going to make a big shift on that from the Trump administration. So basically, if you're the union, it's jobs now versus the promise of jobs tomorrow. That's where they're at. So they um, have jobs from a what had been an incredibly wealthy private sector uh, that had been very wealthy and very booming. And now they're having to shift into what had been mostly until very recently, the promise of future jobs. The more that that's become actual jobs, the more we've seen unions start to shift, but the more that we can guarantee basically through government policy, these, these will be jobs. They will have health care. They will be good jobs for you the more you're going to see workers and unions take that transition. Yeah. But you know, I think that resistance has been understandable, again, from like good paying jobs that are now to 
will, you know, potential jobs in the future. Right. And transitions normal, you know, historically have not been very friendly to workers, whether it's globalization, these free trade agreements, robotics, all of that, not so good for workers. Um, Antonia, I've heard you say several times, keep it in the ground. And I know that it's a, it's a great slogan and a number of environmental organization uses it. But let me just say that it lacks nuance and it tends to exacerbate the tensions between the climate movement and labor. Because again, I just want to reiterate, it means that what we're saying, it, it sounds like then what we're saying is right now we're going to get off fossil fuel altogether, but we're not. We're saying stop continuing to drill and frack, etc. No new fossil fuels. What is already being pumped and fracked will be phased out. And we pledge to you workers that as it's being phased out, you will be trained to transition to equally good family supporting, career supporting jobs. You know, there's that nuance. So I, I, I wish that the climate movement would stop saying, keep it in the ground. You know, the, the, you know it makes a lot of sense. I think you know, there's the, the origins of keep, of keep it in the ground as, a, as an idea come from Ecuador and Nigeria, two countries that have been most devastated by the history of fossil fuel production. And 25 years ago, they, people who were in Ecuador and Nigeria came together to come up with this idea, which was profound at its time, which was to say, even though we have these resources, it doesn't mean we have to develop them. And justice says, that we start this concept of we will keep this in the ground. We will, it, it, it also speaks to this, that is, this is a natural resource. It, it lives in the ground. We've lived with it in the ground. It can stay there. It's okay. And now, as you're saying, to talk with much more nuance of the concept of managed decline, which is it's not everywhere all at once right away. It's managed, it's equitable, it's just. And it's done in a way that ensures, um, that has policy and public support that ensures that workers and communities can make that transition. Yeah. Joe Uline is, uh, is, um, is in the chat room. He's with the Labor Network for Sustainability. And he says, um, the fossil fuel industry is one of the highest union density industries in the country, jobs now. But we should not think narrowly that fossil workers shift to renewables. Think broadly about the economy and establish a federal just transition program to help them. Provide a five-year window of wage and benefit parity, along with education and job training. And then he suggests that people go to the website, uh, laborforsustainability.org. Thank you, Joe, for that. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're we're out of time. Okay. Okay. This is so you great. You are amazing, Thank you. Antonia. I am Thank so you. grateful. You're Thank just, you. you know, so much. I, I want to let people know that next week is going to be very, very interesting having people from the Gulf states talk about frontline. What they are having to go through is unthinkable. I hope you will all join us next week to hear from them. This week has forced us all to take a hard look about where we, at where we are as a nation, but history is gonna judge January 6, 2021 as a day of reckoning for American democracy. The violent raid on the United States Capitol by Trump and GOP insurrectionists made it abundantly clear that there are two sides to the struggle, representative democracy and fascism. Greenpeace and Fireville Fridays are demanding those in power publicly take a side. They must hold Trump and his enablers accountable, preserve the right to peaceful protest and pass legislation that will put the power of our democracy back into the hands of the people. It's time for transformational democracy in America and it has to begin now and it will. And part of this transformation is President-elect Biden and his new administration taking executive action to end the era of fossil fuel production in order to save us from climate catastrophe, protect communities that are reeling from the convergent crises of social injustice, COVID-19 and the climate chaos. Okay, here's what to do. Visit 
buildbackfossilfree.org. Buildbackfossilfree.org in order to tell Biden to act. Buildbackfossilfree.org. Again, I'm just so grateful that you're here today. We're going to be here every Friday. Thanks for joining me. See you next week.